Yeah, I thought uh, I'll talk about uh, Gödel and uh, his famous theorem, Gödel's incompleteness theorem. Because it's something I, I cover in my logic course at the very end. And I think it's, I mean, it's quite fascinating. And also, I think there are lots of people who, who think this is philosophically very, uh, I mean, have some conclusion whether God exists or stuff like this, which I don't think is, has anything to do uh, with this theorem. It's over, over valued, has a sort of populist uh, uh, account, yeah. And, okay, so I'm going to show my ignorance here, though. Is this something you can summarise before we go into the detail? Because I, I don't know. Yeah, I, I, I want it, to start with something which is, hopefully, uh, which is quite simple. What I'm doing in my logic module, which is called Introduction to Formal Reasoning, uh, we, we learn how to use this tool here called Lean, which is an interactive proof system. I think we have done some videos are already. So here I have two propositions, P1 and P2. What does P1 say? P1 says for all natural numbers, n plus zero equals n. And P2 says for all natural numbers, n plus n equals n. So now I want to decide these propositions, which means I want either to prove them or prove the negation. So what I can do here in, in Lean, I can prove P1 in two steps, very easy, yeah, short proof. And I can prove the negation of P2. And here I use just the fact that if n is 1, then 1 plus 1 equals 1 is 2. And that's uh, not, it's that not even Lean knows that this is not true. Okay. okay. So here's my question. Is it true, can I, for any proposition, P, can I prove either P or not P? And that's a question which Gödel, or actually Hilbert already, asked. So if I have a, a proposition P, is my proof system good enough or complete in, in the sense that for any propositions I can either prove P or not P? I mean we've seen in these examples for P1 I can prove P and for P2 I can prove not P, right? But the question is can we do this for any proposition? I'm guessing the answer is no. Yeah, you're, you're as good as Gödel. <laughs> <laughs> let me let me let's look at, a, at another proposition. I, I'm not going into the details here. So that's a famous problem in computer science. It's actually the most famous pro famous problem. It's a problem about problems. Sorry for the for the confusion. The, uh, the problem is uh, 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 is a is a set of natural numbers, a subset of natural numbers, like the set of all prime numbers, set of all even numbers, and, and so on. Yeah. And now we can define the set P as a set of problems which we can solve on a, on a Turing machine in deterministic polynomial time, yeah. so, which is feasible. And then there is a, a class NP, which is the, the set of problems which we can solve on a non-deterministic Turing machine in polynomial time. And yeah, uh, so problems in P are, are easy problems, uh, like, uh, yeah, astonishingly, this is a recent result that the primes are in P, whereas NP are problems like, uh, I give you a, 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 a formula in propositional logic, find out whether there is a satisfying uh, 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 evaluation, a satisfying assignment of truth values, right? So that's quite hard because they're exponentially they're two to the n many lines in a truth table. Um, so that, that usually requires exponential time, but on a non-deterministic Turing machine, you can solve it in polynomial time. Now the qu famous question is, is P equal NP or is P not equal NP? And actually nobody knows. So nobody has a proof of either. That's why it's famous. You can get one million dollar, by the way, if you can yeah, okay. solve it. So. I'll nip home and see. Yeah, yeah. Put some time on it. Yeah. So most people believe that P is not equal to NP, but nobody has a proof. Neither is a proof of P equals NP. But I mean, most likely, it's just because we are too stupid, right? We, 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 well, we'll ask chat GPT and see what comes out. That's a good, always a good approach, yeah. We should try this, yeah. I'm going to. Since we don't know, it could be that our proof system is not strong enough. And this was something already observed by Hilbert, David Hilbert, famous mathematician. He's, he's a really good guy, but here he plays the role of the not-so-clever guy. 
because he said, yeah, I mean, if we have a, a, a logical system which is incomplete, we can just add something and make it complete, yeah? So maybe we have to add this as an axiom that p is not equal to np, and then, then we are fine, yeah? We, we decide this. And basically he thought, if we have an incomplete system, if we just add enough axiom, we will make it complete. And now comes Gödel, yeah? So Gödel defines a, a proposition G, a proposition, so that we can neither prove G, nor we can prove no G, okay? And he did this for the theory of uh, arithmetic. So, which is just a theory of natural numbers with some basic axioms about natural numbers. So let me, yeah, let me go outside of, of Lean and, and let me construct uh, a, a, a Gödel sentence, right? Mm -hmm. Actually, I, I have to move between Lean and, and, and paper, but we'll do this, okay. So, if you look at, at Lean here, uh, when we do a proof, you see this symbol here, this turnstile, right? It's called turnstile, it looks like a turnstile. So we're looking at this G, which is a proposition, and we want that we're not able to prove G, and we're also not able to prove not G. And so, so what Gödel was able to do, he said in the theory of arithmetic, in the theory about natural numbers, with some basic operations like addition and multiplication and some basic axioms, we can always find such a statement. And even better, he could also show that not only in arithmetic, but anything which extends arithmetic, which is for example lean, we can define such a proposition. So how do we do this? Okay, so the first step in uh, Gödel did is, let's say p is any proposition, then we have a natural number, which we which write here funny brackets p, which is a natural number, which represents this proposition. What does this mean? So, so p here is some formula, something which you have seen there for all x, natural number x plus zero equals x, or on and so on. And now we want to represent this inside our system, because the basic idea of Gödel is that we always get this Gödel sentence, this sentence g, if a system can talk about itself if we can sort of implement it in itself. And the first idea is that we can represent these propositions as natural numbers. Now, you can think for a while how to do this, but I'm claiming it's sort of obvious for any computer scientist because you can represent proposition as some bytes in computer memory and some bytes are just a natural number, just a number, maybe a very big number, but it's just a number. And we can also define when something is provable. So let me, let me, let me say this. Let me just pretend I can do this. I say I have a predicate or a set of natural numbers which I call proof. So these are, are the natural numbers which correspond to propositions we can prove. So what, what do I want to say? I want to say if I can prove a proposition P, then it is the same as if I can prove inside my system that the code of P is in the set proof. Okay? So what I'm saying here, I can prove P if and only if I can prove that this, the code of P, is an element of my predicate, of my set. So that means I can encode provability inside my, my logical system. And, uh, and, and Gödel observed that you can do this in arithmetic with a bit of hacking. Uh, you, you can just encode the, the, the provability of arithmetic inside of arithmetic. It's a bit what we do in computer science always. You know, you write a compiler for C in C. Mm. So here we, we, we define the logical system of arithmetic within arithmetic. No big deal. It, it's, it's hacky, yeah, like hell, because you have to do lots of encoding, lots of twiddling, but it's, it's not impossible. It's, it, I, I don't want to write it down. I mean, I can't because it would take a long time. Okay, now let me let me go a little bit further and let's say uh, we really want to think about predicates. If you have a predicate Q, which is a set of natural number, okay. So we, we can do this, so here we do this for P as a proposition, but I can also do this for predicates on natural numbers. So I have this predicate proof 2, which is like proof, but with a parameter. 
And what do I want to say? If Q is a, is a predicate of natural numbers or a set of natural numbers, then I know that I can prove Q of n if and only if I can prove proof 2. Oh, sorry, I, I, I changed this in there. What I want to say is if the pair of the code for Q in the number n is in proof 2. So what proof 2 is, is a bit of a variation of proof. For, for proof is just for, for propositions. But if we can encode proposition, we can also encode predicates. So predicates are just subsets of natural numbers, which we can define here. And we now say, I have a code for every predicate such that I can prove Q of n if and only if uh, the spare Qn is in my proof predicate. So it's a bit of a refinement of the first that I can do this not just for propositions, but also for predicates, which are proposition depending on some values. Right? And now if I can do this, I can define something weird. And this is a set of natural numbers I define in lean. And this is a set of, of codes such that you cannot prove that that n comma n is not in, in, this, in this relation proof to. What does this mean? It, it, it means that, that if n is a code of a proposition, then the proposition applied to its own code. You, you, take, like you take a program and you feed it its own input. Yeah? This is the, the technique of diagonalization which we use in, in lots of situations. So we say, so weird is a set of natural numbers that if n is a code of a, of, a, of, a, of a predicate and I apply it to itself, then it should not be provable. Okay, so it's a, it's, a, it's a set of codes for predicates, which if applied to their own code, are not provable. This reminds me a little bit of the undecidability. Problem. Yes, yes, it's the same idea. It's like it proves something different with the same technique. The technique is called diagonalization. And we use it for lots of things. We use it for, for, the, for the undecidability, but we also use it to prove that, uh, so that there are more than one infinite set. Yeah? The set of uh, uncountable and uncountable sets is bigger than the set of countable. So there are infinite many infinities. It's the same idea. Okay. So, so now if I have the set V at, then something I can define a Gödel sentence. And the Gödel sentence is just, so if I have weird, I take the code of weird, and the question is, is weird an element of weird? So is the code of weird an element of the set weird? Now, by the definition of weird, this is the case. If weird, the code of weird, is not in proof two. And now by the definition of proof two, this is the case, if and only if not the code of weird is an element of the predicate weird. Yeah? What, what did I do? I said, when is weird an element of weird? I must look up the definition. It's the case if, if the code of weird applied to weird is not an element of my proof two predicate. But by, by, by the property that proof two really corresponds to provability, this is the case. Okay, now I should have done a turnstile. This is provable. If this is provable, if and only if, this is provable. So the situation I have, weird and weird is provable if not weird and weird is provable. And that means that this here is a Gödel sentence because now I can prove G if and only I, I can prove not G. Yeah? So G is a, is, a, is a statement that weird is provable for its own code. That is provable if and only if the negation is provable. Now, that means if I could prove G, then I can prove not G, and then I can prove false. That means my system is inconsistent. And if I can prove not G, I can prove G, and it also means my system is inconsistent. So this sentence G, is such a sentence where you cannot prove it and you cannot prove its negation. So is that the incompleteness? That's the incompleteness theorem. It's the first incompleteness theorem. Yes, uh, there is a second one which says uh, that uh, you, you, you cannot prove... Now we can, we can talk about the system in itself, right? And we can ask the question, is, is false not provable? Yeah? If false is provable, 
That means the system is inconsistent. And, and the question is, can we prove that we cannot prove false? So not prove false. Can we prove in a system that it's consistent? And it turns out, and this is the second incompleteness theorem, which relies on the first one, is we cannot prove this either. We, 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 in particular, we cannot prove, which is not surprising. I mean, if you have a logical system, so, so it's like pulling your, yourself out of the swamp, you know, proving, proving in the system itself that the system is consistent. And that's not possible. So that is the second incompleteness theorem. And it, how to prove it is by taking the first one and then going one level higher and encode the proof of the first one inside arithmetic. So it's getting, I mean, it's not technically complicated, but you, you start to lose track on the levels. You know, I'm talking about the system, talking about itself. Yeah, it's just, I'm getting Inception vibes, so. Giving <laughs> what vibes? Oh, do you remember the film Inception? Oh yeah, yes, yes, exactly. Okay, so well which done. is a little bit cliche, but you know, no, a dream inside a dream inside a dream. Yes, that's exactly what's going on, and it's 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 just keeping track of the levels. It, it makes it makes it confusing, yeah. But let me say a few more things about this incompleteness theorem. Uh, first of all, it applies to arithmetic, but if you look at the proof. It actually also works for any system which includes arithmetic. So, so, so it, it, it doesn't help, like Hilbert hoped, that, uh, uh, to make the system stronger, because this defect always remains. You, it doesn't matter how strong you, you make it, you always get this incompleteness. You know? But you can make it weaker. Yeah? So, uh, Gödel observed this incompleteness theorem, all you need is addition and multiplication, which is quite a clever hack. Yeah? Um, but if you leave multiplication out, then it's complete. Yeah? But then you cannot do as much. In particular, in this system, uh, which is called Pressburg arithmetic, it cannot talk about itself, because obviously if it could talk about itself, it would be incomplete. Yeah? But it's useful for, for some things. And there are so, some surprising systems which are complete. So, for example, if you, if you encode the, the logic of the real numbers, the, the, the field of the real numbers, yeah, uh, it turns out that this is complete. So there, because, because you don't have the natural numbers, you cannot do this programming stuff yeah, just with the real numbers. And the real numbers on its, on its own are complete. Yeah? And another example is geometric, uh, geo, uh, ge geometric, ge geometry, geometry. Uh, uh, so Euclid, uh, it was the first axiom system formulated for, uh, about lines and lines being in parallel and cutting each other, and 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 so here he, and the, the axioms of of geometry are actually complete, yeah? but again, in just with lines and points, you cannot talk about itself. So it's a, it's a weak system. Yeah. It is. But on that sphere, if Sean and I start walking due north and we keep our angles with the equator rigidly the same as each other, then the innate curvature of the Earth, so long as you are taking...